And uh, we have just a, a relatively short amount of time to go through a number of questions here. So we're going to try to be as non-case specific as we can with the questions that you have uh, submitted and ask our panelists to be as succinct as they possibly can as well so that we can get through uh, the maximum number of questions. And I uh, would remind you as well that uh, our panelists will be around for a, a little bit after the program. So if there are specific questions or uh, things that we don't get to that you needed to have an answer uh, to, you are welcome to come up and ask. We're going to start now with uh, Dr. Glaspie, uh, and we have a number of questions that have been submitted about the pros and cons of participating in clinical trials, and maybe we can roll a, a couple of other uh, questions into, uh, into that. Uh, someone also asked uh, that, they, uh, that they know uh, clinical trials are available for things like colon cancer and breast cancer, but what about more rare cancers? Um, I don't know of any cons to participating in clinical trials. So that, that makes it a short answer. No there, cons. There okay. aren't any cons. <laughs> um, there, there are rare disease clinical trials available. They tend not to be put out in the community. They tend to be housed at a center, a single center in a region or would be a much more efficient way to do that. And that's how it's done. Okay. Uh, Dr. Call, we have a question as well f about uh, coordination and uh, continuity care, I guess. Uh, someone asks, once diagnosed, in what order should I see a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and a surgical oncologist? How would you go about that? Well, cancer these days is not managed by one person. I mean, as somebody had said, it takes a village to take care of the cancer patients their families, their friend, other supportive care. But in terms of the physician, when a new diagnosis of cancer is made, the emotional reaction is to go to a surgeon, take it off my body. But sometimes that's not the best way to approach it, even though that's an emotional reaction to it. So as much as possible, try to see all the specialists early on together in terms of the medical oncologist, if I see a patient when they're diagnosed with cancer, all options may be open to them. But if I see them after the surgery is performed, some of the options may not be available. So as much as possible, see the medical oncologist, the surgical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, all at the time of the diagnosis. Okay, we've heard a lot about uh, medical technology tonight. Uh, one of our audience members wants to know what are some of the newer diagnostic te technologies on the horizon for early cancer screening and detection, and uh, what recommendations for screening otherwise healthy uh, people with uh, a family or personal uh, history of, of cancer would you give? Maybe we could have Dr. Inoue tackle that one. A couple of questions there. Um, as far as current technologies that are out there, actually they already started, um, one term you're going to hear in the future now is something called breast tomosynthesis. And it's just a different way to do a mammogram where rather than taking just one direct image, um, we're able to take devices of images and then put it together. It does give us more definition in the breast and it will actually improve on several areas that we're looking for. Some things it won't change, like calcifications, but some other areas where we're looking for changes in the breast uh, density or the that there's any kind of destruction in the tissue, it'll show it up uh, easier, better. Um, there's also um, a new contrast, well, not new, but there's another way to do mammography where you inject IV contrast, uh, it's called contrast-enhanced mammography. It's kind of similar to the MRI study, but it's actually in a diff different way to look at how to perform the study. And it becomes a little easier for that. As yeah. far as the breast screening is concerned, or Maybe you could borrow a mic from oh. your neighbor there or something. Yeah. Um, as far as breast screening is concerned, is if one of your family members has had breast carcinoma, it's really kind of important where that person is in your family. In other words, is it a direct sibling? Is it a, a, a mother, a very direct family member? In those cases, what we are recommending, well, one thing we're recommending is that you take the age where that cancer was diagnosed if they were premenopausal, your sibling or your, your mother and you take that and go back 10 years earlier, and then you start screening mammograms at that point. So if your sister was diagnosed at the age of 40, uh, then you'd probably start screening at around age 30. Um, the other thing that you need know, to think about is also looking at some of the genetics of it. If there's a higher risk for you genetically, then there are some other options you have to think about. 
Uh, one of them would be including an MRI in the protocol, maybe alternating it every other year. Um, but then again, that's something more for the oncologists, I think, to talk about as well. Yeah, we have uh, a question on sort of the non-medical front. Uh, some members of our audience are interested, and maybe, Jody, this is for you, um, about specific resources for families and uh, for people going through cancer uh, themselves in Ventura County, and specifically, we have a question here about uh, Simi Valley. What sorts of opportunities are there for people who have experience with this to provide a support system for people who are going through it? Um, the cancer support community is based in Westlake, but we also have um, services that are provided in Ventura and Oxnard, and we have an office in Winnetka. So we don't currently specifically have an office in Simi, although a lot of people will come to either our Winnetka office facilities or to our Westlake offices, depending on what part of Simi they live in. Um, and we have a number of different services that address psychosocial support, such as support groups. Um, we also have educational workshops. A lot of the doctors that are here today have come and spoken for us. Um, we also have other services such as yoga, qigong, um, watercolor, knitting, um, all sorts of different things that help people so they don't have to face cancer alone. Dr. Schweitzer, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, we saw the map with the incidence of uh, breast cancer in particular just a few minutes ago, and uh, we understand that breast uh, cancer has a higher, higher incidence in uh, Ventura County than the rest of California. Maybe you could uh, give us a sort of a crash course on why that would be. Well, that is a very interesting question, and unfortunately, I don't think I could give a crash course on it. It's a, it's a controversial uh, <laughs> subject, why cancer hits in certain clusters. I don't think uh, the message is everybody should move out of the neighborhood. <laughs> I think uh, we learned a lot of this from the lectures that uh, Dr. Glasby gave and Dr. Slayman gave. I think a lot of it has to do with the socioeconomic status, the fact that uh, people out here might be in better health, maybe living longer, we may be seeing some, some skewing, whether it has to do with uh, age or it may have to do with uh, hormonal use, different things that have to do with actually uh, the population. Uh, Dr. Palmer, we have a question for you here. Uh, I believe uh, one of our audience members writes, if a treatment for my cancer that's being recommended to me by my doctor only shows a three-month improvement in survival in clinical trials, but yet has many side effects that are likely to make me feel very sick, why would I want to consider a treatment like that? This uh, question speaks to a misinterpretation of how to apply the data. Uh, Dr. Slayman and Dr. Glasby have referred to a number of clinical trials that in essence uh, have identified uh, potential treatments that it represent advances, but as you've seen, it helps some people and not other people. So when you get a statistical summary for a population that says there's a median improvement of three months, that does not mean that the individual patient and every patient will get three months and no more and no less. What it does identify as a potentially useful treatment if there is nothing else that we can speak to that would further define whether or not this patient would benefit. Uh, it tells you that doing that uh, or pursuing that treatment would be a reasonable option in an appropriately selected patient. Having done so, for the individual patient, it really then no longer matters what the clinical trial data is. What matters is, is this treatment working for me and are the side effects tolerable? And if the answer to both of those questions continues to be yes, then of course you continue with that treatment. And such patients in a way are, are selecting themselves for those in whom you should continue because they are truly benefiting and they'll often get far more than three months mileage. In other words, this, the statistics are identifying who might reasonably consider such a treatment but should not then uh, lock you into a treatment regardless of what's happening in the patient. In other words, you're getting more information about that patient. Dr. Cole, maybe we can bounce back to you for this one. Uh, someone wants to know, for someone who has uh, beaten cancer, what about the importance, um, what would you tell them about the importance of exercise and uh, about organic foods to a, to a healthy lifestyle? All right, yes. Um, you know, Johnny talked about how the patients take care of themselves along with their caretakers and their physicians. And I really have to say I've been doing this for 20 years. 
And I think some of my survivors are probably going to be living better, healthier, and happier, and probably much longer because of their diagnosis of cancer, because most of us initially don't take our bodies for granted. We eat as we please, we don't exercise, we don't take care of ourselves, till cancer happens, because we always think cancer happens to somebody else. And once that happens, we don't take our bodies for granted. And in the process of eating healthy, exercising, taking better care of ourselves, definitely we can help boost our immune system and protect ourselves from both the side effects of the treatment and recover from the treatment. So I definitely support people eating, exercising, and using all form of supportive care to get them through the cancer treatment and recover afterwards. Okay, and uh, on that note, we have a couple, just a couple more questions here before we have dessert, uh, as we are starting to run out of time. Uh, this one for you, Dr. Palmer. Uh, someone wants to know, are there significant advantages to having genetic testing with a company that offers next generation gene sequencing versus more traditional genetic testing? If you want to get to dessert, I will give you the answer no. <laughs> <laughs> if you can hang on a couple of minutes, we, we I'll got a expand couple. on sure. it. Um, I think this is an example of technology rushing a little ahead of what is of practical value to the individual patient. Um, there are subsets of patients who are often identifiable uh, through association of other family members with uh, given presence of given malignancies in whom the risk is so substantively increased uh, that that specific genetic testing is actually highly relevant because it has practical application for the individual patient. So there's a couple of areas, uh, very well known as breast cancer uh, with the uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutations. These are DNA repair enzyme mutations, uh, which in short uh, confer an inability or lead to a loss of ability to repair DNA damage, which is then accumulated, as Dr. Slayman has uh, explained. Uh, and so the risk of that occurring uh, as the underlying cause of breast cancer is particularly where there is a increase uh, in first degree relatives, uh, particularly across more than one generation, and particularly in people in whom that cancer has occurred at a much younger than usual age group, in whom your risk of carrying such a mutation is then substantively greater. There are also individual populations where that risk is high, such as the Ashkenazi Jewish population. So when those features are present, that genetic testing is very helpful for identifying whether or not that's an underlying cause for the disease because it would potentially change your management substantially, not only for the cancer that they have, but even more importantly, for the anticipated cancers that they will subsequently have, which you can head off and prevent. It would be one of the very rare indications, for example, of doing prophylactic bilateral mastectomies and prophylactic oophorectomy or removal of the ovaries. That's one example. The, the other major example would be Lynch syndrome, which is non-polyposis uh, coli, in which patients uh, have a substantively increased risk of uh, colon cancers, but also endometrial cancers, ovarian cancers, renal tract cancers. There's quite a list. Uh, in whom screening for some, some of those things, since you can't lop out the kidneys, uh, for example, uh, is not an option, but identifying it early so that targeted uh, surgical management at an early stage before it's had a chance to advance would substantively change the management. So I would limit my genetic testing to where there is practical benefit to the patient. And finally, uh, and I will emphasize that our, our panelists will be here for a bit uh, after the program tonight, but our last uh, panel question, unfortunately, uh, let's, let's give it to Dr. Slayman here. Uh, with so much information coming out about breakthroughs in cancer research, uh, people want to know how optimistic we should feel at this point that we're getting closer to finding a cure. I think that um, the public has become sort of immune to the sensational reports of breakthroughs and and what we really need to look for is meaningful breakthroughs that improve not just the longevity of life but improve quality of life and do it without inducing or a great cost in terms of toxicity now having said that people have been disappointed in the past because that hasn't happened as much as possible the speed at which that is happening, as I think you've heard tonight from John and some of the things that we've talked about and any of the other panelists, 
could tell you about the speed at which that's happening is so much more accelerated over what it's been just ten or fifteen years ago and as the technology explosion continues and our ability to really ask very sophisticated questions of the tumor cell i think that's only going to accelerate further so i tend to think that i'm an optimist by nature but i am extremely optimistic and i think the objective data show that that is exactly what we're seeing with patients with cancer there are still some that have large challenges there's still some where we have a lot of ground to gain cancers of the pancreas cancers of the ovary just to name a few and but i think it's happening and it's happening rapidly so i remain very very optimistic and would echo what dr glass be said earlier and that is that seeking your care with oncologists who are compassionate and knowledgeable about the state of the art and and current the current literature is is where your your advantages are and with that we're going to conclude our panel discussion we do want to thank you those of you who submitted questions even those we didn't get to it's not the quality of the questions but unfortunately the time that limits it tonight and we do appreciate everyone participating we have a few more words tonight from dr slayman well, the major word is thank you for coming and spending, spending an evening with us. Um, I want to thank my colleagues on the panel, uh, not just for this evening, but for all of the collaboration we've had throughout the years. And uh, I want to thank the organizers who have put together a really fantastic uh, um, evening in a wonderful venue. And I would invite you to enjoy the venue, enjoy the refreshments and coffee, uh, and uh, we'll stick around and ask, ask any questions that uh, answer any, try to answer any questions that we didn't get to that are of a general nature. Thank you. Big thanks to all of our panelists and the speakers tonight. And uh, just a note to you that if you want to share any of the information that you've heard with your friends or colleagues who could not be here, they may uh, enjoy watching the videotape that you can find of the forum tonight. It's going to be available on UCLA, as UCLA Health's YouTube channel and uclahealth.org. And we also would like to remind you to stop by the information tables provided by UCLA Health, the Cancer Support Community, and the American Cancer Society. And there is more information at the uclahealth.org website and the Johnson Cancer Center website. And now, with that, dessert is served. And thank you so much for being part of the event tonight.